Sunday, everyone, and welcome to my show where it really is okay to not be okay. I'm Ray Bonney, a qualified counsellor, workplace mental health specialist, and not to mention a very dedicated and oftentimes enthusiastically disruptive men's issues advocate. It's not every girl's dream job, but hey, remember that men also matter. Well, it's undeniable that we are well launched into the silly season and judging by some of the homes in the Whitehorse Burundara area, not even COVID could put a dent in people's enthusiasm for Christmas decorating. So a big shout out to my daughter Rose, whose house is brighter than the Vegas Strip and has more uh, Christmas themes than Santa's workshop and I adore how much you love Christmas, Rosie Posey. Uh, Anyway, as always on my show and in the spirit of Christmas, I'm unwrapping one of the greatest gifts going around and that's people. Layer by layer, we explore the thoughts, experiences, achievements and challenges of ordinary people bound to inspire the best you. So turn up your radio. The time is just 32 minutes past 10. Now, we just heard from another beautiful Christmas enthusiast, that's Michelle Sicard with her globally popular Italian program, Fantastic Michelle. And uh, now, today I'm going to start by rewinding the clocks all the way back to July 24th, 2015, when I was feeling pretty jazzed to be sharing a stage with world-renowned psychologist and strategist, Dave Burrows. This was at the Sydney Safety Symposium and we were talking about creating environments that support good mental health. I was pretty mind blown by his presentation, as he was with mine, Uh, but we've come a long way in our friendship and collaboration Uh, and to this day Dave continues to hold his own, making massive waves in workplace mental health and like me, embraces the extension of men's health. Um, Most recently, Dave co-founded Mantle. Now Mantle is a men's health service that provides specialist confidential virtual mental health support addressing the stigma around in, sorry surrounding barriers men experience in seeking and engaging with support and this really ties into what international best practice tells us and that um, is one of the key ways to improve men's access to health care is by developing male friendly services which was acknowledged recently in Australia's first national male health strategy now, waiting with Baker to breath, hopefully he's still there. Welcome to the show, Dave. And thank you very much for having me. And what a lovely introduction that is. And there you are. I, you know, sometimes I just marvel at my ability to get these technicalities correct um, very early on a Sunday morning. <laughs> You're doing extraordinarily well. You're making me nervous you're actually doing so well, right? Well, thank you very much, Dave. As I mentioned, you know, the first time I saw you speak, I thought, wow, that's who I want to be. Um, but the female version, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because really, the stuff that you spoke about back then was very new to my ears. And it really, really inspired me to sort of take on a different, less, um, I guess, um, conventional path. Uh, in my work, and so so thank you very much because it really was inspiring. Oh, my pleasure. And I think it's important that there's a few of us out there shaking things up from time to time. Well, unfortunately, there is only a few. But uh, <laughs> now I have this question: Why has it taken me so long to get you on the show? I don't know. It's like ships in the night, though, isn't it? I mean, we've been occupying the same <laughs> space for so many years, yeah. crossing paths at all these different events and things, and then you know, I don't know. Well, you know what happened? Dear friend and dedicated supporter, Suzanne Jones, asked me recently if I could interview one of her superstar clients. And um, she um, she does great work connecting people through her very public relations and wonderful podcast. And so she sent me through this guy called Dave Burrows. And I went, all oh, right, <laughs> been there, done that. Well, not literally, but you know what I mean. We can be a bit risque on the show, Dave. Okay, that's good. <laughs> I'm in a safe space for me. Then. You are, because you're in New South Wales and I'm all the way down here in Victoria. Yep, that's where you are. So, I am, absolutely. Yeah. I'm sitting here in Thoreau, just about an hour south of Sydney, in a little coastal suburb. It's a beautiful sunny day. Um, yeah. Is that where you go surfing? It is. Oh. I, um, I, I live quite near the beach and I try to surf or fish most days. It's one of my big... Uh, sort of balancing acts is to make sure that I am interacting with the ocean as regularly as possible. Uh, good, good for your health and well-being. 
Yeah, absolutely. Now, if anyone checks out my Facebook page and the post that I made uh, on Friday to commemorate this show, you'll see an awesome picture of Dave in a pipeline. And I don't mean a pipeline for work. I mean a, a, a real water pipeline on his surfboard. It, well, it's almost a pipeline, isn't it, Dave? Oh, look, there's a few of those surfing pictures floating around and quite often ask for... Um, do you have professional photos you can share for speaking gigs and these sorts of things? And I, I've got a whole heap of surfing ones. I don't have many corporate ones. <laughs> so I end up sharing ones. Typically, they're with my, my, my children, particularly my daughter. I've got a couple of great photos with her. And they end up sort of uh, you know, doing the rounds on social media, which is quite cool. Oh, that's awesome. Now, um, we actually got indirectly connected through a wonderful woman who's one of my best friends these days and that's Melissa Pollock and she was then the chair of the Safety Institute of Australia New South Wales um, branch and uh, I met her at the Happiness and its Causes Conference and that was also back in 2015 where we were sharing the stage with none other than His Holiness the Dalai Lama which was a bit of a bit of a highlight. Yeah, that is pretty cool. That yep. beats me. I don't have the Dalai Lama on my uh, my CV at all. <laughs> well, I don't think he listened to me at all. Um, I think he'd, he'd left the building by the time I got up there. But anyway, Dave, the show is about you. I've banged on enough. So let's jump right in. Um, I'm going to go back to about 2004 when you established one of Australia's first organisations specialising in uh, the early intervention and prevention of workplace mental health issues and challenges, which is quite an achievement given the appetite for addressing mental health uh, all the way back then. So I'm handing the mic to you. Oh, in this case, it's your mobile phone. Uh, but give us an illustration of this amazing trajectory. Oh, look, was it, it was interesting. I... I... I'd been working as a psychologist in community mental health in the ACT hospital system. I'd been training um, with a, a brilliant organisational psychology firm in Canberra. I'd been also sort of doing an internship with a forensic firm, just trying to find my feet and working out sort of what part of psychology did I want to do. I mean, an avid people watcher, so you know, I was trying to sort of get a bit of exposure to all these different domains. Ended up moving from Canberra to the Illawarra you know, quite a few years ago now, Ended up coming up and working in Sydney because that's where people from the Illawarra typically go and do a lot of their work is in the big up in the big smoke. Was doing Medicaid legal reporting into early into a whole lot of psychological injuries and literally hundreds of psychological injuries in the workplace I was seeing and investigating and reporting on. I was really frustrated. Is it almost everything that I saw that was unnecessary suffering, unnecessary costs, people having a hard time losing sleep, managers stressed, people stressed. I think so much of it was preventable. And if people only had the ability to recognise and respond to early changes in behaviour or understand the workplace factors that were contributing to people's sort of unmanageable levels of stress that was leading to all these sorts of issues, we could have you know, had a whole lot of people having a lot better night's sleep and, and you know, really sort of changed the face of workplace psychology. So, you know, typical me, I got frustrated and then turned frustration into action and then developed a company that we we focus specifically on the psychosocial factors that influence mental health in the workplace. Had a lot of fun, travelled the world on, um, for a few years doing all sorts of bits and pieces with a with a friend, a psychologist friend of mine, and came back and buckled down and got a little bit more serious around really maximising the impact we could we could have working with major organisations across Australia and then increasingly internationally. So it was a lot of fun. We um, you know, it went from a very small business into a medium-sized business and all the stresses and strains of those sorts of things as you develop and grow a company. We we got to work with some amazing companies and got to collaborate with some of the top researchers in, in sort of workplace mental health all around the world. And, and I loved it because what we were doing is we were sort of working with the top ac academics then bringing theory and research to life through the work we were doing. Got to see the impact of that with you know, lots of, you know, huge improvements across so many great organisations. We're fighting against the system the whole time. Well, that was a question that against. I just yeah. had, if you don't mind me jumping in just a little bit. But back then, you know, this, the stigma was even worse than it is now. Um, how did you manage to get traction with such pushback? I was just loud. <laughs> very loud. Very persistent. Um but the way we got traction was by really starting to work with clever organisations and show them what the research was saying. And the research was saying that people's experience of work is a determinant of mental health outcomes. 
Can I also just ask you how relevant that research is now, given that there's been more research, notably, you know, 2014 Price Waterhouse and Beyond Blue with their return on investment um, study that was that contributed to Heads Up, the online workplace program. Oh, look, hugely influential. All of the research in this space, and I think that. You know, one of my big frustrations was is we, we just didn't seem to be learning at a societal level around all the different things. So, you know, the, the, the research in this was happening in the 70s, the 80s. There was a lot of great stuff in the 90s, but it was was typically ignored um, in favour of let's just have an employee assistance program. If someone's distressed, let's outsource that distress. Let's investigate things after they've gone wrong or manage mental illness if mental illness occurs. There was very little stuff happening upstream. And what it took was a few very sort of more sophisticated open organisations who would enable us to sort of challenge the orthodoxy with them and realise, you know what, if we make these changes that's in the workplace, if we make it a supportive environment, if it's psychologically safe and people can speak up and we understand, you know, job demands and job roles and supportive leadership behaviour and all these sorts of things, we can make an actual difference. Well, it's quite quite simple, isn't it? Um, Some of those interventions like, you know, clear job descriptions or onboarding processes. I know, it's not rocket science, (laughs) never has been. (laughs) But sadly, we just saw, I think there was so much fear of this idea of what is mental health, Mm. that organisations would continually rely on an outsourced model or an illness-based model or an awareness-based model, rather than sort of really trying to understand what it was all about. And, you know, I was really proud we got to do some really cool stuff and, and I think, you know, hopefully, and I'm, you know, improve the lives of quite a lot of people through recognising the importance of mental health in the workplace context. Mm. And, I, th- um, I think so you'll, you'll, you'll never have any idea how many people you've, um, you've influenced along the way, and, and nor do you need to, and nor do any of us really need to know how we may have supported somebody through a time. But, you know, I just want to just, again, just underscore a bit of kindness, a bit of care. That's all it takes. You don't have to be a famous psychologist like Dave to make a difference. Oh, gosh. And, and um, you don't need to be a psychologist at all to make a difference. Just the notion of empathy and compassion under, should underpin everything that we do in this space. And, you know, when someone's having a tough time, you're reaching out and having a conversation when somebody's vulnerable and connecting them into the right sort of supports and mechanisms for them. From a workplace perspective, understanding what work factors might have been contributing to that or could be exacerbating that, it's actually so simple mm. and yet we overcomplicate it oh, so much. Absolutely. Like when you're talking about you know illness-based models and reactive models and still yet we're not talking about generational change uh, or um, early intervention is hardly uh, recognised either, especially in workplace. It's just completely reactive. And, and I think until we start you know developing those uh, those models of intervention, it's we're just going to be seeing the same thing over and over again. Well, the thing that I'm seeing at the moment is you see more broadly. Can I get? I'm really lucky. I get to work with lots of huge organisations and smaller organisations and lots of people in this space. And and one thing I see is this massive investment now in workplace mental health, and the massive investment is not turning into massive improvements. No. And I think where we are seeing that investment turn into massive improvement, it's when people are adopting that prevention, early intervention, evidence-based approach to things. Mm. So when we're seeing that evidence come to bear in organisations, we do see improvements. But for far too many organisations, you know, the, the money that they're putting in and the effort they're putting in there is just not reaping the benefits that it should be, which really worries me because when we talk about the benefits, we're talking about people. We're talking yeah. about people's lives. You know, it's not about a number on a balance sheet or a psych injury rate or a cost of a claim. It's about people. And I think often that gets lost in amongst all of this. Do you think, Dave, and this is not being disrespectful to organisations, but do you think in many cases it's a box-ticking exercise that we have EAP, we have fruit in our lunchroom and, you know, we might, you know, allow people to have a mental health day? (laughs) Absolutely. And I think you see that perpetuated by some really large organisations around the world. Mm. Um, I think it's, it is an issue that we, we see that. And I think, is that through malice or ignorance? And I think largely it's from people within those organisations or the organisations themselves just not understanding the research or what's actually required to have a mentally healthy workplace. And I think what we see is um, we see a massive emphasis on marketing and 
not enough emphasis on the actual underlying methodology around what people do in this space. And I think yeah. this is a, a big issue that, we, that we're, we're going to have to have for a long time. Mental health big business now. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, workplace mental health itself is it's a huge industry. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I was, um, you know Rachel Cotton? She's a mate of yours, I think. Um, I know I know a lot. There's actually some lots of Cottons that I know. There's yeah. Sarah Cotton. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry, no, sorry, no, it's Sarah, it's Sarah Cotton. So Rachel, her ca- colleague, I heard her speaking the other day. Um, they work for an organisation, Transitioning Well, and they were talking about um, diversity and how that, you know, I think only something like 8% of organisations uh, are on board with proper diversity and probably about 1% of those even address age as um, a, a point of diversity and inclusion. inclusion. Oh. Look, I love the work of Transitioning World. They yeah. are really evidence research driven organisation. Yeah. And and Sarah and the team are just beautiful yeah. people, which I think makes a huge difference as well. But yeah, I think stuff that they're doing that really sits well with me is they're looking at um, you know, life stage events and the sort of the entire employee life cycle thing and they're really looking at how are we managing and working with supporting sort of uh, older workers and, and I mean mm. they're sorts of you know, they're big questions to ask they're important conversations to us to have perhaps i love the work they do around um you know dad's mental health yeah. you know, for, for new dads i mean i think that stuff there is you just don't hear no. that come up in conversation very often and yet they're they're in there having these conversations and doing this research and that on a you know on a, on a weekly basis they're, they're and that's right and that's the only way it's going to come to the table if it is it does have some evidence-based um you know data behind it as well otherwise people just aren't accepting it yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, it, it's easy to get lost in the stats. Yeah. And I think when we look at the mental health stuff in workplaces too, a lot of the stats, people are looking at the wrong stats. You know, they, yeah. they, you know, they might think, oh gosh, I've, you know, I've got a, we've increased the number of people using our EAP. And it's like, okay, well, Great, is that because yeah. your workplace got worse and more stressful? Or as you did a marketing campaign? Or is that because people are, are engaging in early help seeking behaviour, which is a really positive thing? So yeah. I think. Um, <laughs> but fortunately, you know, in the, in the work I do, I get to collect a lot of those EAP statistics. And, you know, what I see generally is that people are accessing EAP, not necessarily because issue with their workplace, but their external stresses, uh, which I guess is somewhat positive that, you know, people are, you know, seeking help uh, about things just not to do with, with work, but then how organisations collect that data and then translate that into the workplace. I think they've just missed the mark. I think they miss the mark a lot of the time too. And I mean, I think that's, um, you know, we can't turn off the stresses external to work as we come into work in the morning and we can't turn them off coming the other way around. Stress doesn't work like that. It has a cumulative impact on us. And I think that I love the notion of the whole person. Um, yeah. And, you know, if, if we're seeing trends and things around, you know, relationship stress or those sorts of things happening, then, you know, the organisations that I think are really clever are the ones that sort of, you know, give people what they actually need in this space rather than trying to sort of delineate this is a work factor or this is a home factor, which yes. simply just doesn't work. I mean, it spills over. That's that's the truth. Well, the it whole, just comes back obviously. to that kindness and care, doesn't it? You know, it's, it's, it's often not included in, you know, company values and, you know, behaviours is just be kind, be caring, and then that will resonate with, with people. Um, and and I, the lovely thing I see is when you go into some of these organisations where it's in place, Yes. where that's actually a core part of their being and they're wonderful. And, you know, you see people in there, it's not that they're stress-free or they, they don't have mental health related challenges. It's rubbish. I mean, mm. you know, there, there's always going to be issues going on within organisations and no one gets immunity from, from mental health related concerns and things. But just the way in which those organisations are cycles to be safe for people to speak up and, and have that compassion and care at the core of their being, yeah. you know, you can just tell when you walk in the door. Well, that's right. You know, and, you know, I've spoken to you about this before, but I draw a pretty hard line around, you know, it's an organisation's responsibility to create an environment that supports good mental health, safety and wellbeing. And it's the individual's responsibility to enter that environment and behave in a way that they're taking responsibility for their own mental health, safety and wellbeing and contributing to the, to the good culture of that space as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and the, the role that we play as individuals in supporting our own mental health and well-being, I think is sometimes missed. I mean, often there's that reliance on what's the organisation doing, what's the organisation doing, yeah, okay, but what are you doing as well? So I think that's a good call out. Yep, straight away, what, what are you doing? But Dave, I remember, 
when I saw you speak that time, you just mentioned uh, working with the whole person and you had a few models on that, which I thought were absolutely brilliant. Um, but I was thinking uh, when I was writing the show and imagining um, when you think back to what you were speaking about, not even then, but even, f you know, way back in the early stages, do you ever shake your head with how far you've come? I sometimes shake my head and think, oh, my gosh, did I really say that? <laughs> That's probably a little bit more of a common experience for me. I mean, I look at this and, and I mean, I, you know, I'm i pretty vocal. as <laughs> people. No. You know? And I look and I look back at some of the things that I was doing in, early in my career and I was thinking, wow, I probably should have researched that a little bit better. Um, how far we've come. Yeah, look, I'm really excited. I love the fact that we can sit there now and I can see, you know, regulators putting out frameworks and things to support, you know, in practical sense, people's experience of work. You know, we we look at sort of organisations who are started going, you know what, let's just do this right. I, I get really excited when I see those sorts of things happen. I still get frustrated when I see the see the sort of the, the more tokenistic sorts of things occur. But I think that we have, in the last couple of years, things have really accelerated in this space. And it's been nice. Mm. It's been nice to be part of that. Do you ever have anyone push back against you? That, that, All the that, time. Yeah. <laughs> I figure if I'm not, I'm not doing my job properly unless I've got somebody pushing back. Yeah. But I think for me, I want people to push back because I'm willing to be wrong. Mm. And I'm happy to be told that I've got it wrong. And, I'm, and, and rather than seeing that as threatening now, I see that as an opportunity to actually learn more. So yeah. I, 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 I love it when I hear sort of contrary views to what I've got. It's like, okay, help me understand that rather than be threatened by that. And I think that if we could all sort of adopt that approach where we sort of got more curious around what was working and what wasn't working and why different things worked in different situations rather than defensiveness, yeah, we, we would make, you know, we, we would leapfrog, you know, you know, really quickly into sort of, you know, whatever it is that comes next in this space. But there's well, exactly. a, lot of, uh, yeah. a lot of ego. <laughs> yeah. But look, listening is one of those key attributes that improves mental health as well. People being validated and listened to and, and really, really heard improves their mental health. So if somebody, as we said, you know, pushes back or has a different um, outlook than you or I do, and I'm the same as you, I'm very curious to listen about that instead of in the early days just shout them down <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> into a pulp. <laughs> yeah, which, which is, it, yeah, it doesn't support good mental health at all. No, nah, I mean, I, I often just think about the value of being seen. Do people feel seen? Do yes. they feel visible? Yeah. You know, do they feel heard? Like it's just you know, these things don't require immense investment, and, and they're not just relevant for a workplace. They're relevant for community. They're relevant for our households. You know, they, you know, it's, it's you know, I, and I think that you know, I, maybe it's one of the upsides out of COVID. Is there is a, perhaps a little bit more compassion, a little bit more care, a little bit more understanding towards. Mm. Others. I think yeah, I think COVID has unearthed a myriad of um, possibilities and positive things that uh, you know I plan on grasping and sort of bringing a bit more into the limelight how we can use um, these experiences because there's been so much beautiful stuff that's happened in the world. There has, and I and, and uh, there's a. I've got an intellectual crush on, on Professor Professor Brock Bastion from the University of Melbourne. But oh, I love he, he actually talks he <laughs> talks around how um, it sort of elevated our, our humanness is we brought people into our households and our lives in ways that we never had before. And all of a sudden, you know, nobody was perfect. Mm. It was obvious that we all had kids coming in or dogs in the background or half of us couldn't manage tech, you know, that we'd been a lot like just that level of sort of vulnerability that COVID mm. brought about, and that exposure to the fact that none of us have got it right all the time, mm. I think is, it was a, is a wonderful learning to come out of this current environment. Yeah, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed that as well. Just really, you know, getting getting that bird's eye view into you know what it's really like being somebody else, as opposed to you know when we enter the corporate space, you know, we're strangulated by clothes we don't want to wear and by PC. Um, narrative that we don't feel comfortable speaking about, and then all of a sudden now we're we're, we're free to, to be, and I think it was working. I think it is too. I love it the fact that um, I mean I'm still primarily working from home. Yeah. But I'll go down to the coffee shop, you know, nine forty-five every day. Pretty much, it's like the thing that I do. And and the the lovely staff at the coffee shop will be able to say, okay, so what are you doing today? And they call it my mullet. Oh. You're wearing your mullet today. What have you got on? And they know that when I've got the business shirt on top and my board shorts down the bottom. <gasps> That that's 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 what they call my mullet. Is they know that I'm actually going to be on camera, or I'm going to be working with a group of people, or whatnot. And, 
And these <laughs> little things like that, I think, just um, you know, yeah. are much more acceptable now than what they were previously. Oh, completely, completely. The leisure wear. I mean, gosh, imagine how much that industry's boomed during COVID. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, now, these days, your time is spent mainly in advisory, speaking and strategy services, as well as exploring your interest in behavioural ethics, men's mental health and risk um, mitigation. Um, and you may not believe this, Dave, but we're almost through the first half hour of the show, uh, which means we're going to be going to a, a break very shortly. Uh, but when we come back, we're going to be talking about Mantle, which which is your latest venture, which provides specialist confidential virtual mental health services for men. And that was founded by your good self and equally esteemed collaborators, Dr. David Anthony and Luke Foster. Yeah, it's certainly a fun one, the one we're very proud of, that's for sure. Mm. And um, I was I sort of uh, was a bit remiss in uh, speaking a bit more about uh, David Anthony and Luke Foster um, because I know that they've worked just as hard as you um, getting this um, up and running. But um, how did you guys get together? Oh, it's just an interesting one how we got together. I'd actually known Dave Anthony, a doc, we, you know, Doc Dave, for, for many years. Um, we'd all have uh, varying levels of experience working with Australian Defence Forces psychologists. Um, I was a reserve uh, special service officer psychologist and both Dave and Luke were officers in the, in the Army um, as, as psychologists. So they'd known each other for a long time as well. Dave and I had worked in different sort of training activities and specialist roles within defence and got along really well. I actually ended up bringing Dave in and he ended up working with me in, in one of my previous um, companies. So we're great mates as well as as sort of as well as sort of collaborators and psychologists as well, and through their relationship, I got to know Luke, and so you know, you know Luke's also got quite a, a you know, great career within the Australian Defence Force. He's a really sort of well-established psychologist as well, and you know, three blokes who got, did a lot of work within male-dominated sectors had a lot of varying expertise and experiences in the research space, in the sort of military space, in the corporate space, in the construction space. You know, we just and a common alignment around what we wanted to do to in, in, improve people's lives. So it was a, actually quite a nice way in which we came together and ended up collaborating on on that mantle project. Mm. Um, and yeah, you know, we're really excited to see it all come to fruition now and the impact that we're, we're having already, which is really really cool. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing that because uh, I think it's really important. You know, that people understand that. You know, even though you're an expert in your space and you have been mucking around in it for a long, long time, doesn't mean that you know it's not possible to be keep, keep creating uh, new and better ways uh, of approaching what your passion is. Yeah, I just think there's, we've still got so much to learn and so much to do in this space, mm. um, and it, and you know, I, and I, I think there's a heck of a lot of good that we can that we can bring to the world, and, we, and a heck of a lot of improvement we can have to people's lives if we sort of, you know, experiment, explore, start to do things a little bit differently to the way that we've done in the past because, yeah. you know, what was there before was pretty good. Mm. Australia's system's not bad, but there's certainly room for improvement. Yeah. Well, do you know what? I've, before we go to the break, I've got one tip for people. If you're there scratching your head going, what can I do to better support people, um, you know, to minimise the risk of mental health issues, here's the tip. Return emails, return phone calls, full stop. That's it. Yep. Um, so yeah, maintain connections. <laughs> yes, just 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 do that, and that will take the fear, the uncertainty out of so many people's lives. If you can just get back to somebody to say, "Got your email," the answer's no, whatever it might be, but just get back. I think that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> Now, um, we're going to go to a break, but before that, Dave, this is the time we start rolling out my very special guest song requests, and I've mixed up your selection, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a hint for the first one, okay? And then you're going to tell me what it means to you. So here goes the hint. How did I forget you for the show, and perhaps my mind is simple? Hmm. Now you did request this song, so I did request this song. Now I'm going to get myself into trouble here because there's so much thinking that had to go into these songs. I can, Ray, I um, can help you out. <laughs> I think I know which one it is. Uh, would it relate to a movie called The Breakfast Club? Ah, uh, yes. It would. Ah, uh, yeah. That's the, the Simple Mind song. Uh, don't you forget about me? Yeah. Um, an amazing song. 
you know, you know, I think music is a bit like food for me. It's got this ability to transport you back to a particular point in time, mm. you know, and and that's Simple Mind songs for me. I think that's just the Breakfast Club movie. I think was one of the greatest movies I've ever watched, and I and oh. you know, time of my life when when that movie came out and the nerd, the jock, you know, the rebel, all these different people sort of stuck in this room and just the dialogue. And if you look at that movie, it's, you know, it's pretty much shot in the one single room. And I think that uh, the whole message that everyone was carrying around something, we only ever see the tip of the iceberg and, and just the sort of how we can have people from sort of diverse backgrounds, you know, almost opposing backgrounds, sort of uh, connect and, and, and be a little bit vulnerable and, and, and share an experience. I think it's just a, a you know, that... Great. The song represents, yeah. represents a really, really interesting point. Welcome back. The time is just six minutes past 11. And you're listening to 94.1 FM. It's 3WBC with Ray Bonney, joined by Dave Burrows. He's a well-recognised expert in psychological risk management and best practice approaches to workplace mental health. Welcome back, Dave. Did that song take you all the way back? Yeah, it did. It's, it's a great song. So thank you very much for that. Um, giving me permission to actually put that in and include that in, the, in this little section today. Well, do you know what? I think it's my guests report to me one of the most enjoyable parts of the show is actually getting to select their songs and hearing them play on air. So there's just another example. It doesn't take much people to make others happy. Speaking of which, Dave, tell me, what does it feel like being you today? I knew this question was coming because this is a common question when I speak with you, Ray. And, and I was reflecting on it before, and I tell you, so it feels pretty good. Um, but I'm conscious that we've had a monstrous year, as has everyone, but my next few weeks are really stacking up to be, that's a big hill to run up. So, and I've convinced myself at the moment, I think it's might be a, that I've got a thin veneer of control over what's happening, and I've broken things down into manageable pieces, but I'm really conscious, and that, you know, there's a little bit of anxiety sitting in the background there knowing that I've got really big things happening in a very compressed time frame moving forward and that's going to influence the way that I sort of think and behave and, and sort of and, and manage between now and Christmas and into the new year. So, mm. yeah, a bit of trepidation there I think is probably a reasonable way yeah. to put it. I would also say great level of self-awareness as well and, you know, ability to be able to articulate that publicly I think uh, is is something that not everyone has a grip on. <laughs> it's not something I've got. I'm very good at either. I think it's taken me a very long time to um, to move beyond just being frustrated or annoyed or angry and understand. Okay, what sits beneath some of those sorts of things? So it's it's a work in progress. So you took your own medicine, did you? Well, I did. I mean, I've been really lucky in my career. I've been able to work with sort of people who are you know, a lot smarter, a lot more insightful, a lot more experienced than I am. And, and I find there's been certain people that I've worked with who, so just by virtue of being with them for periods of time, that some of the way they see the world and operate, some of their reflections and levels of curiosity is rubbed off on me, and, and I always get, I think, a little bit of um, a little bit more insight from, from spending time with with a few of those people. There's a few of them that really stand out, so it's, um, mm. yeah, I think they're making me become a little bit better at some of these sorts of things. Oh, fantastic! Well, somebody's just sent me a text saying you said you were going to talk about this mantle thing. Can you just shut up, Ray, and get on with it? Okay, I'll do that. Um, so, Dave, over to you. Tell us about Mantle. Yeah, uh, look, Mantle, um, specialist psychological health service for, for men, um, something that took a long time for us to develop and get right. So what we know is that there's some brilliant stuff being done out there in, in, in sort of mental health landscape to support the needs of men. There's these brilliant organisations like Mr Perfect and Men Sheds and, and lots of sort of community social catch-ups we know are really important. But when we looked... When we looked at those, we thought, okay, they're such an integral part of the mental health infrastructure for men. But there's a huge gap between those and then the crisis lines and you know, your lifelines and your men's lines and things that people were reaching out to at the point of crisis. And, and we sort of thought, okay, but what's this big gap here and where do men go when they need more specialist mental health support? So you know, where, do, where do they actually go? And, and no way. Now, if you look at the sort of statistics out there, you know, where men are so overrepresented in the wrong stats, like suicide rates, where we are not engaged in sort of mental health treatment services to the extent to which we should be compared to compared to females. And so we thought, okay, let's get serious about this and, and develop a service that brought specialist psychologists to men when times that they actually needed it in ways that suited them through a specific gendered lens 
so that we could plug a really big gap that we saw in the mental health system when it came to supporting the needs of men. So this is why we we developed we developed Mantle, which is a specialist telehealth service manned by very senior, very experienced psychologists that's available for men at times that suit them. The after hours during work, um, you know, four hours whenever. So it's um, only telehealth, Dave, it's not face to face? It's not face to face, it's just telehealth. It's using a very secure platform. Uh, where men can actually seek support in places that they feel safe and places they feel comfortable. So we know that for a lot of blokes, the time when they need psychological support is that sort of time when they're working really hard, they've got family stress going on, they might have financial stress going on, there's a whole lot of stuff happening at work, is their time poor. And to be able to say, hey, and let's take time off to go and see a GP and get a referral and wait six weeks to see a psychologist, we thought there was a flaw in the system. So rather than, you know, perpetuate that or keep going that we thought let's just build a service mm. that's there for men when they need it in areas where they're comfortable at times that's ready that you know most suitable for them so we're really excited that we we worked with some really clever researchers and looked at okay how do we you know attract and retain men in special psychological support how do we get the best clinical outcomes actually can i just um, go back to that um i'm just curious about that point that how do you attract and retain men in the service? Can you just kind of, you know, boil that down a little bit about those research outcomes? Yep. So we blokes are not as represented as females in actually you know, seeing psychologists. The other challenge we've got there is there's huge dropout rates. So there's a very large percentage of men who will start, you know, some sort of therapeutic intervention or special psychological support, and then they opt out almost after the first session without ever without ever letting things sort of get to the point where they can genuinely improve their symptomology, their clinical outcomes, you know, improve the things that they need to work on in order to you know, be the best version of them, the best version of themselves. So, you know, one is the issue around the numbers of people who are accessing professional services, and it's cumbersome. It was cumbersome for them to actually go and do that. Then there's the retention rates. So, you know, the psychologists can be good, and we've got great psychologists, but we're not going to change your life in, in 60 minutes. No. You know, we need time to be able to work with people, understand what's going on, engage with them, you know, plan with them, collaborate with them. You know, it's not the sort of thing where, you know, you just get this magic sort of solution after after one session. And I think one of the things that, that we're seeing is we, through our service, we're able to retain men in that psychological support for a much longer period of time. So, you know, we, we're already sort of kicking some pretty big goals as far as that retention piece. Mm. Yes, it's it's interesting because it comes up all the time for, for men and women and I guess that some of the challenges that you just described about, you know, accessing um, um, health support at the right time and also, you know, male-friendly services are very, very few and far between and if you look at all of the, you know, the, the larger crisis support organisations like Lifeline and Beyond Blue, they're all very female-centric and that's why females feel a lot more comfortable accessing them so I'm just so pleased to hear you speaking about something that has been designed for men to uh, I guess um, address some of these barriers and absolutely um, I mm. mean international research is showing that we need a gendered lens when it comes mm. to men's mental health yep um, that the way that we communicate with men the way that we sort of support men is different yeah and if we can actually get narrow that down and we can get that right you know we can have my huge inroads into this area which is something that we're really committed to doing i mean we've got this sort of catchphrase we say we're going to we're going to help men become better fathers better partners better brothers better friends i mean we just want to improve the lives of men and by doing that we can improve the lives of a whole lot of people in and around them as well mm. we know that you know Often blokes are not that great at looking after their physical health, but you know what? Like they're, they're not necessarily known for being as proactive as what they should be when it comes to supporting their mental health, which is what we're trying to. Yeah, I, I, whenever I hear that, I just my hackles or shackles, whatever you call them, just go up because it. You know, we we talk about this thing about you know men not seeking help or not being so aware or not taking care of themselves. And that wasn't the way that they were born. That's the way that they've been raised. And so the assumption that it's just a male thing, it's not. Um, and, you know, we were talking about this generational change and early intervention thing. I think we really need to be speaking and, and helping our boys to 
have self-respect and self-awareness and really care for their physical and mental being. Absolutely. And I think the generational thing there is something that stands out. I mean, I, I grew up in that era where you did not show emotion unless, A, a good dog died, or, two, a bone was sticking out. Now, that was it. That was the only time you were actually allowed to yeah. show emotion in my era. Mm. Um, now, my household was not necessarily quite that extreme, but I think it's just to illustrate the point. Mm. Um, and I, I mean, I, I don't think um, that we have to stop men being men, but I think the notion of it being strong and it, to, yeah. to engage in early help-seeking behaviour and a sign of strength to actually seek support when you need it. I think those yeah. sorts of things are really important. Well, that's right. And just the idea, getting away from the idea that it's men that can't seek help or men that can't care for themselves, but perhaps, dare I say, it's the women that are raising them. <laughs> I mean, that's probably a little politically incorrect, but I said it. Oh, it's okay to be a little bit politically incorrect. <laughs> I, think, uh, I, I mean, I, I think there are a lot of issues out there as well around... Um, you know, how do we support our men? How do we support them in the family context? How how many relationships have I seen that have broken down unnecessarily because the partner or a household didn't realise that, hey, Dad wasn't just angry and drinking too much because Dad was a rat bag. Dad was depressed. Yeah. You know, there's all these sorts of things that I think we could... There's all lots of different areas related to men's mental health where we can make improvements. And that's why mental of, is so important, isn't it? Because I guess this is where these issues are addressed and it's not just going back to the popular narrative of men don't seek help, men don't show emotion. And, Absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah. even look at the way in which depression can manifest in men can be quite different to in, in women. Uh, but, mm. you know, when we talk, when we think around depression, you know, what do we typically think about? Someone who's withdrawn and someone who's sad and someone who's crying. Well, with men, you know, that can be someone who's, you know, uh, who's angry, who's frustrated, who perhaps is, is making really unhealthy you know, lifestyle choices, you know. Yeah, or acting uh, out, yeah. Yeah, so I, I just think there's, there's lots lots of work and lots of work to be done in this space. Some organisations are doing some brilliant work in this space. Mm. I love the fact that it's getting attention now and I'm really excited that with Mantle and our team that we can be part of the solution. Yes. Um, you know, not just for now, but for, you know, hopefully really change the way that we look at men's mental health. Yeah, well, when we um, do the final break, I want to talk about some of the work that we're doing at the Australian Men's Health Forum. And recently, uh, we just published a 10-step guide to developing male-friendly services because we also recognise the need um, to work with the government around uh, the national male health policy to, to bring this you know, gendered approach uh, to men's health. So, um, so we'll go a bit deeper into that um, after the break as well. Sounds good to me. Yep. So I, I've just completely railroaded you um, with, <laughs> with the mantle thing, but I just think it's really important because we live in this echo chamber, Dave, of men's health. So we know it so well, we live it and breathe it. But for people that are kind of new to these ideas around changing this narrative and approach to men's health, I think it's really good for us to pick it apart a little bit more um, just to demonstrate like a mantle how that can be very, very instrumental in getting men, um, and do you see boys as well, or just men? It's pro we have designed the service to typically see men, yeah. but we've got a team of psychologists that can see women as well, can see adolescents as well. We're not a specialist adolescent or child service though, yeah. but we've got, a, we've got a really highly experienced team. So all of our psychologists at the moment have got 10 years' experience post-training, yeah. primarily in... in um, male-dominated workplaces, and we have specialist programs and ongoing development programs for, for all of our team around the men's yep. mental health piece. And so, you know, you know, nothing's really off limit for us, but what we're able to do is if, if we can't do it, we'll, we'll recommend who to go to, what the referral options and those sorts of things might, yep. might be as well. So given it's all online, um, what, um, what are the payment methods like? So there's a couple of different options. So it's all the telehealth. So there's basically a link to a secure sort of video chat um, but there's the option of coming in and getting performance coaching. So performance coaching might be, hey, I'm having a bit of a tough time. I, you know, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm unwell, but I'm, I might need to make some better choices, or I might need a bit of fine tuning in a couple of areas. And we'll have a brief solution oriented approach there. So that's something where a lot of people accessing that service uh, might be executives or reluctant users or new to mental health services, and they're not going through Medicare. Mm -hmm. quite frequently. Yeah. Then we've got your more traditional, clinically-oriented services, which is very much this, just a virtual equivalent 
of a physical psychology practice where you can come in, mental health plan, if you've got a mental health plan, you don't have to have a mental health plan, and you can have subsidised sessions through the, through the Medicare system. So we put multiple gateways into our services because we know that no two men have got the same needs. Yeah. The drivers behind someone accessing services like ours are going to be quite different. And we want to make sure that we've given enough avenues in for people to get the support that they need rather than just making an assumption straight away, hey, what you need is a clinical session or you need a Medicare session, you know, really sort of trying to make that so we can fit the needs of our of our customer base. Mm. Well, they're people. Um, just remember that, that like a traditional psychology practice um, at Mansell Medicare and private health uh, fund subsidies are available for, for their yeah, services. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, Absolutely. Um, www. I don't even know why we say that anymore. <laughs> just go to mantlehealth.com. Mantle yes. That's M-A-N-T-L-E. For those that can't spell that Dave said under his breath. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we see, we see a lot of typos with people typing mantle. So uh, oh, yes. well, I'm getting used to spelling it out for people now. <laughs> um, but I, I think... One of the other things, the beauty of this service is that it's there's no barriers to um, location as well. So you can be reaching remote people as well. And we know here in Australia, you know, our farmers and remote workers uh, often don't have access to this kind of service. So I guess that's another upside, isn't it, Dave? That was very deliberate in the way we did that because we know that, you know, um, even if I'm in the Sydney CBD and I've got to go and see a psychologist in Randwick, you know, I'm losing half a day, mm. losing almost a full day perhaps to do that. How do we remove some of those barriers and obstacles and have things available for men in times that suit them and in locations that suit them? You know, we might have a very specialist in, in sort of relationship issues in Western Australia. That doesn't stop or doesn't preclude someone, you know, a, a client from Queensland tapping into that level of expertise that we've got available there. So I love the fact that we are truly national yeah. and that we reduce those those, um, those barriers. It's also really great for us as well because we get to give fantastic flexibility to our psychologists, mm. you know, a lot of whom are at that stage of life where, you know, they, they want that additional flexibility as well. and. And they're going to do their best work, not after they've commuted for three hours to get to work, but when they're actually, you know, working from their home office or in, in sort of locations that suit them as well. Well, you mentioned being a national organisation and having national reach, but given that it's online, would it have global reach as well? We plan to actually make Mantle uh, a global organisation. It's one of the things that we want to do. We've been very deliberate in our testing and our building and very cautious in making sure that everything is right. Um, but I've worked a lot internationally. I've worked a lot in Asia. I've worked in Europe. I've worked in, in you know, Oceania. Oceania, and and we know that everywhere that we go, there is a need for more specialist service for men. And we do see Mantle as something that actually will hopefully improve the lives of you know hundreds of thousands of men, not just here in Australia, but millions of men. Yeah. Worldwide. Well, given Dave that men come in all shapes and sizes, and you know Australia being the multi cultural, uh, beautiful tapestry that it is, uh, how do you get across uh, language barriers? Yeah, language barriers is a tricky one and it's not something that we have been geared up to manage right at the moment. Um, so it's not something that, that we, we, we are currently able to deal to is, is, a, is a multilingual mm. based approach. Um, so these, it's certainly an area that we, we, we probably should be focusing on in the in the future when we look at sort of expanding things more more mm. broadly. And I guess this means, you know, getting specialists in who are bilingual. Yeah, which yeah. we will do. I mean, one of the challenges that we have is having the right people on our team. Yes. Um, we think that, you know, people are worth having really good, you know, support mechanisms, you know, having really good people support them. So we're really, we don't just don't let anyone come and join the medical team. We're really particular around who comes on board, what's their experience, what are their qualifications, you know, how do we know they are going to get the best outcomes for us? So there's a bit of a process involved for us in even just making sure that we're just not uh, not just letting all and sundry come in and, and become a mental practitioner. You know, um, yeah. being the right fit for our organisation and our client base is really important to us. Well, that's right. You've got to maintain your integrity and your, your um, equal levels of quality and standard, don't you? Absolutely. And in the mental health landscape at the moment, that's something that, 
you know, can be a little bit questionable at times. I mean, um, oh, yes. It's the the number of people hanging up a shingle as, as mental health experts or practitioners and these sorts of things, without necessarily having ongoing, continuing professional development or industry body recognition or you know, tertiary qualification, it, it, it can be a little bit worrisome. And we're really focused on making sure that you know we have that professional integrity there. Yeah, well, I think it's very good that we have excellent governing bodies here, uh, peak bodies like APRA or PACFAR, you know, organisations like that where. Um, to get membership as a practitioner, you've got to jump through a fair few hoops and to be able to demonstrate, um, you know, good practice uh, on an annual basis to, to maintain that membership as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think um, you know, continuing professional development is absolutely critical and, and having people who know what's in and outside of their lane, you know, yeah. what are the stuff they're good at, you know, what, you know, rather than dabbling in all sorts of things, how can we get people with that, you know, relevant expertise? It's yeah. quite important. Actually, just a little light bulb went on in my head then, Dave, thinking about professional development and mantle and given that you're probably collecting data but also you're researching as well, would you provide professional development opportunities as part of mantle to practitioners to learn more about men's health? We are in our space, so it's one of the things we're very committed to within our team, and we're actually part of um, a more broader research project as well, uh, the Boy Project, part of the Million Minds Fund. It's looking at uh, various approaches to the prevention of suicide in men and boys. So yeah. part of that is we're going to be working with another specialist organisation and looking at their professional development programs and the various impact of those on a on a suicide prevention perspective mm. as well. So. Certainly something that we're really keen on is making sure that there is a higher level of professional development in the men's space out there. There's actually not a lot there now. No. Now, no. we've spent a fortune and, and a lot of time actually developing our onboarding programs and looking at and trialling what is international best practice. Yeah. What is all the data saying in this space? And we're, we're really lucky we've been to, able to tap into the likes of, you know, Dr. Zach Seidler to actually yeah. look at a lot of their research as well. So, mm. you know, I think we'll see a lot more specialist men's mental health professional development become available over yeah. 12 months or so. Well, he's, he's really stepped it up, Zach, hasn't he? You know, being with Movember now, I guess, and having um, access to those um, research pathways and yeah, support. Yeah, he's a clever guy. And yeah. I think this is one of those things that, you know, we're, we're a very much an evidence-informed organisation and we need to rely a lot on the researchers who are actually doing some of that sort of really groundbreaking work in this space as well. Yeah. Yeah, I would say Zach Seidler makes men's health look sexy. <laughs> <Just does. laughs> you can say that, right? I don't know if I'm quite comfortable saying that, but uh, he's another one that I've got a bit of an intellectual crush on. It does yeah. happen from time to time, but I, I really love his work. Yeah, me too. Me yeah. too. He's um, yeah, he's great. And, you know, just for such a young person to, I mean, I'm not exactly sure how old he is, but he just seems to have just done a lot in a short period of time that's, you know, just got a lot of um, integrity attached to it. He does, and, and the thing I really like about Zach, he's got energy attached to that integrity as well. Yeah. And he's charismatic, and I think that's really going to help him get maximum penetration for the, the important research that he's doing. He's, he's one of those people I think he'll be able to bridge that the you know, academia and practitioner worlds in a, in a really important way. Mm. Well, there you go. We're, we're off to our last break um, and into our final segment, Dave. Uh, where as I mentioned before, we're going to be speaking about the importance of developing more male-friendly services just like Mantle um, and how we educate our um, um, PHNs and how we educate people how to create, you know, more male-centric services like you've done. And thank you for the great insight that you've given um, me and also our listeners today because it was it was really articulate and painted such a clear picture. Um but Dave, it's time for my second uh, very special guest song request, uh, which in your case comes again with a cryptic clue. Uh, so are you ready for that? I am. Okay. I am nervous but ready. <laughs> Dave, I get the impression that you're a mighty, mighty contributor to men's health. <laughs> <laughs> mighty, mighty boss tones, the impression that I get. Um, you know, we all have different parts of our life where, you know, you do things that are great and you look back and go, oh, my gosh, I was so wayward then. Well, the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones was, that song was uh, an important, really important one for me. It was sort of when I was 
you know, I had a couple of false starts at university. I you know, had you know, a bit of a tricky run becoming a psychologist. Oh, and did you? This is what I've, got. Oh, I'm, I've just written that question down. Thank you. Yep. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, so this is when I'd actually gone back and I was having a second dig at it. And uh, I just love it. It was, the, you know, uh, Australian National University with some rat bag mates having a time of our lives at the same time trying to balance, uh, you know, being a good student and, and sort of putting myself in a position where I could actually have a reasonable career as a psychologist. But, you know, the, the past 11 and you're listening to 94.1 FM. It's 3WBC with Ray Bonney joined on the line by Dave Burrows. Now, Dave, I'm going to give you a shot here at describing who you are. Who I am? Hmm. Crikey, that's a big question. <laughs> I'm a dad. I'm a partner. I'm a surfer. I'm a fisherman. Um, I am a pretty knockabout 48-year-old bloke. Um, I'm more typically confused as being a bricklayer or a truck driver <laughs> than I am with being a psychologist. People assume that I've had a career in rugby union because I'm quite a stocky little fella. Um, and who else sort of... A, and I'm, I'm a complex, you know, I think fairly typical... Whatever typical means, typical Australian mum. I, I think you absolutely nailed that. Absolutely <laughs> nailed it. Uh, and I love that you didn't just go run straight down the professional path, that you actually brought your whole self into that. And uh, is your family listening in today? No, they're not. They've left me alone in the house. So I'm, I'm very deliberate in making sure that I don't lead with work stuff. Um, yeah. One of the companies that I, I, I built many years ago, I spent seven years building that company and it was right when we just had our first daughter. And my wife told me after seven years of me travelling around Asia Pacific with that company that I'd spent the equivalent of one entire year away from home. Mm. And that was a big wake-up call for me and that effectively I'd missed the equivalent of a year of my my, my beautiful daughter's life. So um, that was a, an important point for me to focus a little bit less on the work stuff and a little bit more on the on the family stuff. Yeah. Um, often it, it, it takes that, doesn't it? And some people aren't as fortunate um, to be able to rectify that. So um, that's really... I'm lucky I've got a very forthright and vocal wife. <laughs> I couldn't imagine you with a wallflower, um, Dave. That would be... Um... No, she keeps me on my toes, right? <laughs> now, speaking of um, beautiful men, I just want to give a shout out to one of my devoted listeners. His name's Marky Mark Brown. Uh, that's not his birth name. That's just what I like to call him. But uh, his grandmother would have been 98 this week. Uh, so happy birthday to Mark's nan and uh, lots of love to you, Markless. Thank you for always being such a wonderful supporter of my work and also of, of this very show. So there you go. Do you have any shout outs that you would like to make, David? No, I think I'm, I'm not going to be able to beat that one anyhow. That was pretty cool. <laughs> uh, now, I said before that we were going to uh, talk about uh, international best practice and um, developing male-friendly services, sort of just to um, continue the conversation around Mantle. Um, and as I mentioned, this was acknowledged uh, in Australia's first national male health policy. Even when I say that, Australia's first national male health policy, why has there never been one before? Um, and that called on all health professionals to make their practices more male friendly. And even more recently, uh, Christine Morgan's Suicide Prevention Task Force uh, in her first uh, recommendation to the Prime Minister uh, has made uh, male suicide a priority for the first time ever as well. So we are getting there. We're starting these conversations. It's getting to the place where it needs to be, where uh, you know the approach is something that probably has the best chance of minimising um, the risk and also making a dent in those horrific statistics. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Dave, uh, my work at the Australian Men's Health Forum. I'm the vice president there now, and you know we've for the last couple of years we've been really, really focusing on developing um, strategy that can assist um, in bringing you know be better male services uh, to those who need it. So, um, I, you know, clearly there's no one size fits all approach that we've just talked about for all men and boys, but there are differences between groups of men as as well as differences within individual men themselves that need to be taken into account, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, 
traditional masculine norms mean so many different things to so many different people. And I think that that is really important that we do have a really person-centred approach to these things rather than just making an assumption that it's a one-size-fits-all. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's where sort of promotion is important because it really does identify male-friendly languages as a key characteristic, characteristic. And you were just talking yourself about, you know, you being a typical, say, Aussie bloke. Um, you know, there's a certain language around that. And if you want men to listen, speak to them in the language that they can hear um, by giving, you know, like perhaps giving your service a male-friendly name, but also just understanding who you, your audience is as well. Yeah, meeting people where they're at, I think is just such an important part of this. Understanding the, the how and why men experience different episodes of mental Ill health or illness, you know, the traditional masculine norms, the you know person-centred approaches, you know strengths-based approaches. Looking at the literature around, you know, how do we get the best clinical outcomes and support outcomes for men? Mm. Oh, I think these are such critical things that we need to have as part of all of our education for people working in this space. Mm. And and that 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 approach as well. <laughs> Earlier this year, I was called in. Um, one of my areas of specialty is um, crisis management and trauma management, and I was called into an organisation who'd experienced a workplace death. And um, so it was a bit of a stand-up start. Saturday morning, you know, about 100 blokes out in the yard. And I walk in and the feedback later was, we saw you walk in and went, oh, who's this? Is Here's some Sheila going to tell us what to do. And um, and then they said, and then you opened your mouth and we knew that you, knew that we knew that you were one of us. I, mean, yeah, right. I think the first word I said may have started with F. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> well, I think I think that's so important. Though. I mean, meeting men where they're at. I mean, um, you know, executive men. I mean, one of the things that we're really particular with is how do we build a service where reluctant users would come on board and engage with our professional psychologists. So, yeah. you know, which is one of the reasons why we have you now the different entry points for our organisation is just to be able to ensure that we can we don't have people falling through the cracks. Yeah. Exactly, and that's that's what happens, and that's the stuff that really contributes to those uh, terrible statistics that we were talking about. You know, now that um, the um, suicide statistics in review, now nine suicides that we know of every day in Australia, and seven are men. And, uh, you know, the popular response to that was, oh, that's because of COVID, and no, those statistics were released before COVID. So uh, it, it is a real issue, um, and... We, you know, it's just too many men dying. So I think um, cultural factors also um, include how men are viewed generally and the importance of um, social connection, uh, the, the power of getting men involved in building support networks as well. So if you want men to get help, allow them to give help in the process as well because men like to do that. Yeah, and I think there's some great efforts out there at the moment. I mean, Movember's leading a lot of the things in this space. I love the Mr. Perfect stuff. I love the men's Mr. Stuff Perfect there. has just come out of the blocks, hasn't it? I was going to say him. <laughs> yeah, Terry. Um, Terry. Good yeah. people. You yes. Know, like said, um, and, and providing a really valuable, really, really valuable service. I mean, I think that... Um, I think we need to really support all of those sorts of areas there that really upstream stuff around things like connection are just so important, yeah. as well as giving them avenues of the where to next if things aren't quite right, because I think that was a big missing piece that we had there for a while. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's where Mr Perfect is a really good example of, I mean, it started off as a humble barbecue, and now it's this national health promotion charity that um, does so much more. And Yeah, absolutely. And, and that was blokes getting together to help each other. So uh, perfect example of you know, men being involved in the process that's going to help them because they know what, they know what to do. And I mean, I think, I mean, a lot of people think about men and they think construction and blue collar and, and we know that Mr. Perfect has got such a diverse range of people that are yep. involved in that. Mm. You know, it's, 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 it's something for, for everyone from all walks of life and I think that's a really powerful part of, of, of what they're doing as well. Yes. Um, but I think there also needs to be better structure as well because structure underpins all the activity, like from employing male staff and volunteers, building health programs around men's interests and harnessing men's strengths because men are expected to be strong and independent. 
um, and men help themselves with male-friendly information and guidance, simple tips for self-care, self-management and opportunities to engage online like Mantle. Um, but there does need to be some sort of structure for men to instinctively to know where to go because at the moment, you and I both know this, it gets to a point where you know, we know that most male so suicide is not to do with a, a mental health challenge or a mental health um, a mental illness, but to do with a situational crisis, which imp which does impact mental health, of course. Um, so we just need to be understanding that if we're supporting these this structurally, like if you look at things like um, our family law systems that you know, occupy a lot of men who are going through that relationship breakdown, financial distress and custody issues. Well, putting better structure around that to keep those men alive. I think that's really important too. And I think you raises a really important point there is, is when we're talking around intervention around mental ill health, we're not necessarily just talking around mental illness per se. No. You know, how are we helping people with family stress, relationship stress, financial stress, work stress, you know, stage of life things, the marital breakdowns, all those different bits and pieces that happen are the stuff that we need to be, that's where we need to be intervening at before things spiral down to the point of, of, of that crisis level. Yeah. I think this is where we, where we start to move the conversation further upstream and we help people and we support people during those points in time. That's when we start to make a really big difference on you know, some of these sort of terrible statistics and things that we're seeing now. Yes, and, and violence against men as well. It is a thing, people, and, um, you know, it's something that's not being addressed at all. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I was having this conversation with somebody the other day um, uh, around the domestic and family violence. They, they actually asked, you know, is this something that affects men as well? And, and I was like, okay, well, two of the most pronounced, you know, DFE situations that I've sort of seen over the last last 12 months or so have, have, have actually been directed at men um, mm. and, and things that, that people were absolutely shocked to hear that that went on, mm. that went on as well. And that's not taking away from the severity of the impact of that, you know, across everybody, but it was just interesting to see how yeah. little understanding there was in that milestone. Oh, that's right. I mean, I, I would love to be seeing domestic violence as an everybody's issue. And, um, and again, going back to what I bang on about, that generational change and early intervention piece just to see how it gets to that point rather than just dealing with the point of collision to unpack you know how it got there in the first place and there are just so many things that we can do to minimize the risk of that happening and if you know women are statistically more vulnerable well then let's do something about it before it gets to that point yeah, anything towards the early intervention, prevention rather than management of is exactly where I think we should all be actually paying our attention, uh, paying attention to and investing our sort of effort and resources. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, getting into the the rugged part of the conversation, I'm gonna I'm gonna just turn it on its head now, Dave. And um, as we head out into our last fifteen minutes of the show, uh, coming up next, by the way, is the divine Paula Hogg. And Paula will be rolling out an entire lazy Sunday afternoon of music and banter, uh, bound to get you pretty relaxed. She's pretty amazing. She comes in every Sunday on the train from South Yarra, which is no mean feat, um, carrying her bag of CDs and, yeah, turns up out about three hours of uh, great music. So stay tuned for that. Uh, if any of our discussions today have brought up uncomfortable feelings for listeners, please remember help is there uh, and here's a couple of options or a few options for further support. Uh, Lifeline, the number there is 131114. Suicide Callback Service, 1300 659 467. And of course, emergency services is triple zero. Any, any other ones that you want to add there, Dave? I think that's a pretty comprehensive list. They're the ones that I use all the time. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for you actually giving people a reminder about that. So thank you, Ray. <laughs> it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Now, I hearken back to our previous segment when uh, we were going to the break and you mentioned your university days and the song that we played. Um, may I ask you what that experience was was that you were um, going through, or is that too much information? No, it's not too much information. Um, 
I took a gap year between year 12 and university. I lived in a very small town on the south coast of New South Wales. I hadn't been in the big smoke much and I had a, a really fantastic but less than adequate experience in university when I first when I first went there. I bumped into a great mate of mine who I hadn't seen for years and I spent you know, quite a bit of my time at the university pub. Yeah. Um, I actually really struggled because you know I was a pretty good student, but I was broke. And after the first couple of years of uni, I was really struggling to make ends meet. I actually ended up on food stamps. I was struggling to to even get by. Yeah. So I, I quit uni. Um, I wasn't performing as well as what I should have. And I went and became um, an earth moving contractor. And I went out and I worked in the earth moving space for a number of years. I had a back injury. Mm. And when I had that back injury, the rehabilitation provider suggested that um, because I was a bobcat driver and obviously not very smart, that I should uh, put uh, you know, computer parts together on a construction line or look at some sort of other you know, manual labor sort of task, which I think you know, there's nothing wrong with those activities, but just the fact that they assumed that because I was in the earth-moving space that I you know, wasn't fit to do anything else was a, a bit of a shame. I ended up going back to uni um, and, uh, you know, and becoming you know, a fair bit better student than what I was, a little bit more purpose than what I had. The first time that you were at uni, were you studying psychology then? I was studying psychology, but I was also studying the um, the bottom of a schooner glass at the university (laughs) bar, probably a little bit more than what I should have been, um, and really enjoying that university experience. But um, it took me a couple of goes. But one of the things going back as a sort of semi-mature age student, I went back with a lot more focus, a lot more dedication. And I think it actually made me a lot better psychologist Mm. in the long run because I'd I'd gone and worked in the construction space. So I you know, hadn't had the traditional career where I'd go to uni, you know, mm. get your degree, go out, do your internship or your, your master's and then and become a practitioner. I, I thought it gave me some really wonderful real-world life experience, which may be one of the reasons why people now confuse me as a, um, as a bobcat driver or a truck driver rather than being a psychologist. Because, because you are one in essence, really. I am, and I always will be, and I love it, and I wish I could still do that work now. Nothing better than digging a big hole and filling it back up again. Yeah. How many years before you first started at uni and the next? I had uh, three and a half years off. But I had to go back on a graduated basis because I'd had a I'd had a back injury. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a you know, it was an interesting interesting transition back into uh, into sort of the you know, university life after. Oh well, I, I, I didn't know that about you, um, but it it makes sense um, how you've told that story. It's probably why, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit rough around the edges still. <laughs> oh, well, is it rough around the edges or is it just, you know, the, the real version of you that um, you don't um, perform for others rather than just bring yourself? Oh, I, think the, I think the real version of me is I am rough around the edges. I think I was before I started. I think I'll finish my career rough around the edges. But um, I've done apologising for that now. <laughs> oh, gee, though. But, you know, how, um, how people gravitate to you, though, because they feel that level of... Um, trust and security and safety in um, in your being comfortable with yourself as well. Yeah, it's not. I mean, I think that um, I, it takes a lot of learning to be a little bit more open, a little bit more vulnerable, and you realise just the, how important the, you know, stories and things are and other people's experiences are in this space as well. Mm. I mean, I think, it's, I think it can be tough being a, um, a man. I think there's a lot of pressures on men in today's uh, day in... in and age, I think there's been a lot of pressure, pressure on men, you know, well before that. But, I mean, how can we actually enable men to still feel as if they're men and at the same time be vulnerable and, and mm. sort of open themselves up to, to different experiences and early help-seeking behaviour and these sorts of things? And then it's one of the things that I'm really committed to is encouraging people to, to sort of, you know, you know realise mm. that, you know, it doesn't make you any less of a man to sort of say, hey, I haven't got it right all the time or I need some help here or to seek support early. And yeah. I, I, I try to model that as best as I can myself. Do you think the expectations of men, though, have become very, very confusing and conflicting? Um, in... I think they can be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think um, you know, partner, provider, protector, confidant. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think that um, there, there's... So there is a fair bit of pressure there, and, and you know what mm. you can and can't say these days. Am I going to be politically correct? Am I yeah. sort of PC enough? You know, I, I think there's you know even you know, I think there's a lot a lot there, a lot going on. Yeah, and I think we're seeing some of the impact on some industries like teaching and healthcare, where men are now becoming a little bit more cautious about entering those industries uh, because they feel 
you know, quite concerned about how they might be interpreted in certain um, settings or that they might not get it quite right and be, be vulnerable. Yeah, it, it can be tricky. I mean, and, you know, fear of getting things wrong. Yes. Can actually inhibit our ability to develop and grow as well. I mean, um, so I, I can understand that. Yeah. Um, now, next time I'm back on air is uh, Sunday the 10th of January, which will be 2021. Um, and I will actually have my very first studio guest since March this year. So it will almost be a year since we've uh, had guests live in the studio. And Kath Elliott, uh, she's a professional working mum based in Melbourne. Um, and she's always been very fit, active and led a healthy lifestyle. So uh, she was in complete shock when she was diagnosed with uh, locally advanced triple positive breast cancer. Um back in August 2019. Uh, so her life as she knew it was um, turned upside down, as you would imagine, um, and at the start of um, a path that she, she never expected. So make sure you tune in to hear Kath's story uh, on the 10th of January. Um, on a really serious note, and I'm sure you'll join me with these sentiments, Dave, the festive season is a wonderful time for people to be together and um, celebrate with family and friends. But for many Australians, uh, there will be a male missing from the, festi for the festivities due uh, to suicide. Um, and we know that. So every day, as I said, we lose nine Aussies to suicide, seven men and two women. Um, so again, I just want to remind everyone, Lifeline 131114, 1300 659 467 is the suicide callback service and emergency services is triple zero. Uh, and also on that note, you know, while we're celebrating and, um, and sharing things um, all festive, people in general, not everyone has the privilege of having big families or big friendship groups or friendship groups at all, family at all. So bearing in mind it's, it's not a happy time uh, parents that have been alienated for the, from their children also is a big one at Christmas time. So uh, just be mindful that sometimes it's just a little smile to somebody in the street or, um, you know, helping somebody down the stairs, whatever it might be, um, just that little bit of kindness and care. It's, uh, it's bloody helpful. Isn't it, Dave? Oh, absolutely. You just, Empathy is such a powerful thing, and I think it's always remembering that we only ever see the tip of the iceberg, that every single one of us has got things going on behind the scenes. And if you've got the option to show that little bit of kindness, you know, you'll never regret doing it. Yep. No, um, you can't. So, um, Dave, do you have a parting or parting words of wisdom for today? Oh, I'm not sure I've got any wisdom at all, Ray, but um, <laughs> I think parting words of wisdom for me, or at least maybe just some ideas to think about is that no one gets immunity from the stresses and strains of life. It doesn't matter your gender, it doesn't matter your age, it doesn't matter, none of us get out of this thing without without sort of experiencing some level of challenge at some point in time. I just think the more that we can encourage people to, you know, engage in early help-seeking behaviour, get beneath the surface of the issues that might be causing them stress, to stop just trying to suck it up and deal with things and and to really try and support themselves and invest in their own well-being, I think that's such an important thing for us. Um, now, often we give so much of ourselves to others, but we need to also focus on our own self-care and, and taking care of ourselves as well. Mm. You know, festive season is no distant, is no different, and, and festive stress is real. So, um, mm. you know, just please take time to prioritise yourself, you know, over this festive period as well. Fantastic, great, great parting words. Uh, and just quickly, can you take us out today with your final special? guest song request which doesn't probably need any promoting because you know what it is i think it's a lot well, i don't know I, I think i gave you two oh. which, which one did we go with well i'll <laughs> tell you it's the choir boys run to paradise so oh um, absolutely i'll take you out with this one because it just brings back wonderful memories of being in my mates tirana driving way too fast <laughs> along the streets of bateman's bay when i was 18 years old and i think um it's another one there that, you know, as soon as you hear that song, as soon as I hear that song, it's just like, okay, what a wonderful, carefree point in my life that was. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. And a nice summer feel uh, to that departure as well. So thank you so much for coming on the show today. Again, I, I can't work out why I've not had you on sooner, but um, let's have you on again as well. 
Oh, thank you for having me. I feel really grateful for the experience, Ray, and um, yeah, wonderful. I really do appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. Well, um, finally, everyone remember that it really is okay to not be okay and just ask that question, what does it feel like being you today? See ya.